Section eight of the Wood Beyond the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corrie Samuel. The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris. Chapter twenty two of the Dwarf and the Pardon. Now she began to say, My friend, now shall I tell thee what I have done for thee and me, and if thou have a mind to blame me, and punish me, yet remember first, that what I have done has been for thee, and our hope of happy life. Well, I shall tell thee. But therewithal her speech failed her, and springing up, she faced the bent and pointed with her finger and she all deadly pale, and shaking so that she might scarce stand, and might speak no word, though a feeble gibbering came from her mouth. Walter leapt up, and put his arm about her, and looked whitherward she pointed, and at first saw naught, and then naught but a brown and yellow rock rolling down the bent, and then at last he saw that it was the evil thing which had met him when first he came into that land and now it stood upright, and he could see that it was clad in a coat of yellow samite. Then Walter stooped down, and gat his bow into his hand, and stood before the maid while he knocked an arrow. But the monster made ready his tackle, while Walter was stooping down, and or ever he could loose, his bowstring twanged, and an arrow flew forth, and grazed the maid's arm above the elbow, so that the blood ran, and the dwarf gave forth a hush and horrible cry. Then flew Walter's shaft, and true was it aimed, so that it smote the monster full on the breast, but fell down from him, as if he were made of stone. Then the creature set up his horrible cry again, and loosed withal, and Walter deemed that he had smitten the maid, for she fell down in a heap behind him. Then waxed Walter wood wroth and cast down his bow and drew his sword, and strode forward towards the bent against the dwarf. But he roared out again, and there were words in his roar, and he said, Fool, thou shalt go free if thou wilt give up the enemy. And who, said Walter, is the enemy? yelled the dwarf. She, the pink and white thing lying there, she is not dead yet. She is but dying for fear of me. Yea, she hath reason. I could have set the shaft in her heart as easily as scratching her arm, but I need her body alive, that I may wreak me on her. What wilt thou do with her? said Walter. For now he had heard that the maid was not slain, he had waxed wary again, and stood watching his chance. The dwarf yelled so at his last word, that no word came from the noise a while, and then he said, What will I with her? Let me at her, and stand by and look on, and then shalt thou have a strange tale to carry off with thee, for I will let thee go this while. Said Walter, But what need to wreak thee? What hath she done to thee? What need? What need? roared the dwarf. Have I not told thee that she is the enemy? and thou askest of what she hath done, of what? Fool, she is the murderer, she hath slain the lady that was our lady, and that made us, she whom we all worshipped and adored. O oh, impudent fool! Therewith he knocked and loosed another arrow, which would have smitten Walter in the face, but that he lowered his head in the very nick of time. Then, with a great shout, he rushed up the bent, and was on the dwarf before he could get his sword out, and leaping aloft dealt the creature a stroke amidmost of the crown, and so mightily he smote, that he drave the heavy sword right through to the teeth, so that he fell dead straightway. Walter stood over him a minute, and when he saw that he moved not, he went slowly down to the stream whereby the maid yet lay, cowering down and quivering all over, and covering her face with her hands. 
Then he took her by the wrist, and said, Up, maiden, up, and tell me this tale of the slaying. But she shrunk away from him, and looked at him with wild eyes, and said, What hast thou done with him? Is he gone? He is dead, said Walter. I have slain him. There lies he with cloven skull on the bent side, unless, forsooth, he vanish away like the lion I slew, or else, perchance, he will come to life again. And art thou a lie, like to the rest of them? Let me hear of this slaying." She rose up, and stood before him trembling, and said, "'Oh, thou art angry with me, and thine anger I cannot bear. Ah, what have I done? Thou hast slain one, and I may be the other, and never had we escaped till both these twain were dead. Ah, thou dost not know, thou dost not know. O oh me, what shall I do to appease thy wrath? He looked on her, and his heart rose to his mouth at the thought of sundering from her. Still he looked on her, and her piteous friendly face melted all his heart. He threw down his sword, and took her by the shoulders, and kissed her face over and over, and strained her to him, so that he felt the sweetness of her bosom. Then he lifted her up like a child, and set her down on the green grass and went down to the water, and filled his hat therefrom, and came back to her. Then he gave her to drink, and bathed her face and her hands, so that the colour came aback to the cheeks and lips of her. And she smiled on him, and kissed his hands, and said, Oh, now thou art kind to me. Yea, said he, and true it is that if thou hast slain, I have done no less, and if thou hast lied, even so have I. And if thou hast played the wanton, as I deem not that thou hast, I full surely have so done. So now thou shalt pardon me, and when thy spirit has come back to thee, thou shalt tell me thy tale in all friendship, and in all loving kindness will I hearken the same. Therewith he knelt before her, and kissed her feet. But she said, Yea, yea, what thou willest, that will I do. But first tell me one thing. Hast thou buried this horror, and hidden him in the earth? He deemed that fear had bewildered her, and that she scarcely yet knew how things had gone. But he said, Fair sweet friend, I have not done it as yet, but now will I go and do it, if it seem good to thee. Yea she said, but first must thou smite off his head, and lie it by his buttocks when he is in the earth, or evil things will happen else. This of the burying is no idle matter, I bid thee believe. I doubt it not, said he, surely such malice as was in this one will be hard to slay. And he picked up his sword, and turned to go to the field of deed. She said, I must needs go with thee. Terror hath so filled my soul that I durst not abide here without thee." So they went both together to where the creature lay. The maid durst not look on the dead monster, but Walter noted that he was girt with a big ungainly sax, so he drew it from the sheath, and there smote off the hideous head of the fiend with his own weapon. Then they twain together laboured the earth she with Walter's sword, he with the ugly sax, till they had made a grave deep and wide enough, and therein they thrust the creature, and covered him up, weapons and all together. CHAPTER Twenty Three, OF THE PEACEFUL ENDING OF THAT WILD DAY Thereafter Walter led the maid down again, and said to her, now, sweetling, shall the story be told. Nay, friend, she said, not here. This place hath been polluted by my craven fear, and the horror of the vile wretch, of whom no words may tell his vileness. Let us hence and onward. Thou seest I have once more come to life again. 
But, said he, thou hast been hurt by the dwarf's arrow. She laughed, and said, Had I never had greater hurt from them than that, little had been the tale thereof. Yet whereas thou lookest dolorous about it, we will speedily heal it. Therewith she sought about, and found neither streamside certain herbs, and she spake words over them, and bade Walter lay them on the wound, which forsooth was of the least. And he did so, and bound a strip of his shirt about her arm, and then would she set forth. But he said, Thou art all unshod, and, but if that be seen to, our journey shall be stayed by thy foot soreness. I may make a shift to fashion thee brogues. She said, I may well go barefoot, and in any case I entreat thee that we tarry here no longer, but go away hence, if it be but for a mile. And she looked piteously on him, so that he might not gainsay her. So then they crossed the stream, and set forward, when amidst all these haps the day was worn to mid-morning. But after they had gone a mile, they sat them down on a knoll under the shadow of a big thorn-tree, within sight of the mountains. Then said Walter, Now will I cut thee the brogues from the skirt of my buff coat, which shall be well meet for such work, and meanwhile shalt thou tell me thy tale. Thou art kind, she said, but be kinder yet, and abide my tale till we have done our day's work. For we were best to make no long delay here, because, though thou hast slain the king dwarf, yet there be others of his kindred who swarm in some parts of the wood as the rabbits in a warren. Now true it is that they have but little understanding, less it may be than the very brute beasts, and that, as I said afore, unless they be set on our slot like to hounds, they shall have no inkling of where to seek us. Yet might they happen upon us by mere misadventure. And moreover, friend, quoth she, blushing, I would beg of thee some little respite, for though I scarce fear thy wrath any more, since thou hast been so kind to me, yet is there shame in that which I have to tell thee. Wherefore, since the fairest of the day is before us, let us use it all we may, and, when thou hast done me my new foot-gear, get us gone forward again. He kissed her kindly, and yea said her asking. He had already fallen to work on the leather, and in a while had fashioned her the brogues. So she tied them to her feet, and arose with a smile, and said, Now am I hale and strong again, what with the rest, and what with thy loving kindness, and thou shalt see how nimble I shall be to leave this land, for as fair as it is. Since forsooth a land of lies it is, and of grief to the children of Adam. So they went their ways thence, and fared nimbly indeed, and made no stay till some three hours after noon, when they rested by a thicket side, where the strawberries grew plenty. They ate thereof what they would, and from a great oak hard by Walter shot him first one culver, and then another, and hung them to his girdle, to be for their evening's meal. So thence they went forward again, and naught befell them to tell of, till they were come, whenas it lacked scarce an hour of sunset, to the banks of another river, not right great, but bigger than the last one. There the maid cast herself down, and said, Friend, no further will thy friend go this even. Nay, to say sooth, she cannot. So now we will eat of thy venison, and then shall my tale be, since I may no longer delay it, and thereafter shall our slumber be sweet and safe as I deem. She spake merrily now, and as one who feared nothing, and Walter was much heartened by her words and her voice and he fell to and made a fire, and a woodland oven in the earth, and Sithence dighted his fowl, and baked them after the manner of woodmen. And they ate, both of them, in all love, and in good liking of life, 
and were much strengthened by their supper. And when they were done, Walter eked his fire, both against the chill of the midnight and dawning, and for a guard against wild beasts. And by that time night was come, and the moon arisen. Then the maiden drew up to the fire, and turned to Walter, and spake. Chapter Twenty Four The Maid Tells of What Had Befallen Her Now, friend, by the clear of the moon and this firelight, will I tell what I may and can of my tale. Thus it is. If I be holy of the race of Adam, I wot not, nor can I tell thee how many years old I may be. For there are, as it were, shards or gaps in my life, wherein are but a few things dimly remembered, and doubtless many things forgotten. I remember well when I was a little child, and right happy, and there were people about me whom I loved, and who loved me. It was not in this land, but all things were lovely there, the year's beginning, the happy mid-year, the year's waning, the year's ending, and then again its beginning. That passed away, and then for a while is more than dimness, for naught I remember, save that I was. Thereafter I remember again, and am a young maiden, and I know some things, and long to know more. I am nowise happy. I am amongst people who bid me go, and I go, and do this, and I do it. None loveth me, none tormenteth me but I wear my heart in longing, for I scarce know what. Neither then am I in this land, but in a land that I love not, and a house that is big and stately, but naught lovely. Then is a dim time again, and sithence a time not right clear, an evil time, wherein I am older, well nigh grown to womanhood. There are a many folk about me, and they foul, and greedy, and hard, and my spirit is fierce, and my body feeble, and I am set to tasks that I would not do by them that are unwiser than I, and smitten I am by them that are less valiant than I, and I know lack, and stripes, and diverse misery. But all that is now become but a dim picture to me, save that amongst all these unfriends is a friend to me an old woman, who telleth me sweet tales of other life, wherein all is high and goodly, or at the least valiant and doughty. And she setteth hope in my heart, and learneth me, and maketh me to know much, oh, much, so that at last I am grown wise, and wise to be mighty if I durst. Yet am I naught in this land all this while, but, as me seemeth, in a great and a foul city. And then, as it were, I fall asleep, and in my sleep is naught, save here and there a wild dream, some deal lovely, some deal hideous, but of this dream is my mistress apart, and the monster withal, whose head thou didst cleave to-day. But when I am awakened from it, then am I verily in this land, and myself, as thou seest me to-day. And the first part of my life here is this, that I am in the pillared hall yonder, half clad, and with bound hands, and the dwarf leadeth me to the lady, and I hear his horrible croak, as he saith, Lady, will this one do? And then the sweet voice of the lady saying, This one will do, thou shalt have thy reward. Now, set thou the token upon her. Then I remember the dwarf dragging me away, and my heart sinking for fear of him. But for that time he did me no more harm than the riveting upon my leg, this iron ring, which here thou seest. So from that time forward I have lived in this land, and been the thrall of the lady. And I remember my life here day by day, and no part of it has fallen into the dimness of dreams. Thereof will I tell thee but little, 
but this I will tell thee, that in spite of my past dreams, or it may be because of them, I had not lost the wisdom which the old woman had erst learned me, and for more wisdom I longed. Maybe this longing shall now make both thee and me happy, but for the passing time it brought me grief. For at first my mistress was indeed wayward with me, but, as any great lady might be with her bought thrall, whiles caressing me, and whiles chastising me, as her mood went. But she seemed not to be cruel of malice, or with any set purpose. But so it was, rather little by little than by any great sudden uncovering of my intent, that she came to know that I also had some of the wisdom whereby she lived her queenly life. That was about two years after I was first her thrall, and three weary years have gone by since she began to see in me the enemy of her days. Now why or wherefore I know not, but it seemeth that it would not avail her to slay me outright, or suffer me to die, but naught withheld her from piling up griefs and miseries on my head. At last she set her servant, the dwarf, upon me, even he whose head thou clavest to-day. Many things I bore from him, whereof it were unseemly for my tongue to tell before thee. But the time came when he exceeded, and I could bear no more, and then I showed him this sharp knife, wherewith I would have thrust me through to the heart if thou hadst not pardoned me in now. And I told him that if he forbore me not, I would slay, not him, but myself. And this he might not away with, because of the commandment of the lady, who had given him the word that in any case I must be kept living. And her hand, withal, fear held somewhat hereafter. Yet was there need to me of all my wisdom, for with all this her hatred grew, and wiles raged within her so furiously that it overmastered her fear and at such times she would have put me to death if I had not escaped her by some turn of my law. Now further, I shall tell thee that somewhat more than a year ago hither to this land came the king's son, the second goodly man, as thou art the third, whom her sorceries have drawn hither since I have dwelt here. Forsooth, when he first came, he seemed to us to me, and yet more to my lady, to be as beautiful as an angel, and sorely she loved him, and he her, after his fashion, but he was light-minded and cold-hearted, and in a while he must needs turn his eyes upon me, and offer me his love, which was but foul and unkind as it turned out, for when I nay said him, as maybe I had not done, save for fear of my mistress, he had no pity upon me but spared not to lead me into the trap of her wrath, and leave me without help or a good word. But, O oh friend, in spite of all grief and anguish, I learned still, and waxed wise and wiser, abiding the day of my deliverance, which has come, and thou art come. Therewith she took Walter's hands and kissed them, but he kissed her face, and her tears wet her lips. Then she went on. But sithence, months ago, the lady began to weary of this dastard, despite of his beauty. And then it was thy turn to be swept into her net. I partly guess how. For on a day in broad daylight, as I was serving my mistress in the hall, and the evil thing, whose head is now cloven, was lying across the threshold of the door, as it were, a dream fell upon me, though I strove to cast it off for fear of chastisement. For the pillared hall wavered, and vanished from my sight, and my feet were treading a rough stone pavement instead of the marble wonder of the hall, and there was a scent of the salt sea, and of the tackle of ships, and behind me were tall houses, and before me the ships indeed, with their ropes beating, and their sails flapping, and their masts wavering. And in mine ears was the hail and howl of mariners, 
things that I had seen and heard in the dimness of my life gone by. And there was I, and the dwarf before me, and the lady after me, going over the gangway aboard of a tall ship, and she gathered way and was gotten out of the haven, and straightway I saw the mariners cast abroad their ancient. Quoth Walter, What then? Sawest thou the blazon thereon, of a wolf-like beast ramping up against a maiden? And that might well have been thou? She said, Yea, so it was, but refrain thee, that I may tell on my tale. The ship and the sea vanished away, but I was not back in the hall of the golden house, and again were we three in the street of the selfsame town which we had but just left. But somewhat dim was my vision thereof, and I saw little, save the door of a goodly house before me, and speedily it died out, and we were again in the pillared hall, wherein my thraldom was made manifest. Maiden, said Walter, one question I would ask thee, to wit, didst thou see me on the quay by the ships? Nay, she said, there were many folk about but they were all as images of the aliens to me. Now hearken further. Three months thereafter came the dream upon me again, when we were all three together in the pillared hall, and again was the vision somewhat dim. Once more we were in the street of a busy town, but all unlike to that other one, and there were men standing together on our right hands by the door of a house. Yea, yea, quoth Walter, and forsooth one of them was who but I. Refrain thee, beloved, she said, for my tale draweth to its ending, and I would have thee hearken heedfully, for maybe thou shalt once again deem my deed past pardon. Some twenty days after this last dream I had some leisure for my mistress's service, so I went to disport me by the well of the oak-tree, or forsooth she might have set in my mind the thought of going there, that I might meet thee, and give her some occasion against me. And I sat thereby, no wise loving the earth, but sick at heart, because of late the king's son had been more than ever instant with me to yield him my body, threatening me else with casting me into all that the worst could do to me of torments and shames day by day. I say my heart failed me and I was well nigh brought to the point of yea saying his desires, that I might take the chance of something befalling me that were less bad than the worst. But here must I tell thee a thing, and pray thee to take it to heart. This, more than aught else, had given me strength to nay say that dastard, that my wisdom both hath been, and now is, the wisdom of a wise maid, and not of a woman and all the might thereof shall I lose with my maidenhead. Evil wilt thou think of me, then, for all was I tried so sore, that I was at point to cast it all away, so wretchedly as I shrank from the horror of the lady's wrath. But there, as I sat pondering these things, I saw a man coming, and thought no otherwise thereof but that it was the king's son, till I saw the stranger drawing near and his golden hair, and his grey eyes, and then I heard his voice, and his kindness pierced my heart, and I knew that my friend had come to see me, and, oh, friend, these tears are for the sweetness of that past hour." Said Walter, I came to see my friend, I also. Now have I noted what thou badest me, and I will forbear all as thou commandest me till we be safe out of the desert, and far away from all evil things. But wilt thou ban me from all caresses?" She laughed amidst of her tears, and said, O oh, nay, poor lad, if thou wilt be but wise. Then she leaned toward him, and took his face betwixt her hands, and kissed him oft, and the tears started in his eyes for love and pity of her. Then she said, Alas, friend, even yet mayest thou doom me guilty, 
and all thy love may turn away from me, when I have told thee all that I have done for the sake of thee and me. Oh! if then there might be some chastisement for the guilty woman, and not mere sundering! Fear nothing, sweetling, said he, for indeed I deem that already I know partly what thou hast done. She sighed, and said, I will tell thee next, that I banned thy kissing and caressing of me, till to-day, because I knew that my mistress would surely know if a man, if thou, hadst so much as touched a finger of mine in love. It was to try me herein, that on the morning of the hunting she kissed and embraced me, till I almost died thereof, and showed thee my shoulder and my limbs, and to try thee withal, if thine eye should glister, or thy cheek flush thereat. For indeed she was raging in jealousy of thee. Next, my friend, even whiles we were talking together at the well of the rock, I was pondering on what we should do to escape from this land of lies. Maybe thou wilt say, Why didst thou not take my hand and flee with me as we fled to-day? Friend, it is most true that were she not dead, we had not escaped thus far. For her trackers would have followed us, set on by her, and brought us back to an evil fate. Therefore I tell thee, that from the first I did plot the death of those two, the dwarf and the mistress. For no otherwise mightest thou live, or I escape from death in life. But as to the dastard, who threatened me with a thrall's pains, I heeded him nought to live or die, for well I knew that thy valiant sword, yea, or thy bare hands, would speedily tame him. Now first I knew that I must make a show of yielding to the king's son, and somewhat how I did therein thou knowest. But no night and no time did I give him to bed me, till after I had met thee, as thou wentest to the golden house, before the adventure of fetching the lion's skin and up to that time I had scarce known what to do, save ever to bid thee, with sore grief and pain, to yield thee to the wicked woman's desire. But as we spake together, there by the stream, and I saw that the evil thing, whose head thou clavest e'en now, was spying on us, then amidst the sickness of terror which ever came over me whensoever I thought of him, and much more when I saw him, Ah, oh, he is dead now. It came flashing into my mind how I might destroy my enemy. Therefore I made the dwarf my messenger to her, by bidding thee to my bed, in such wise that he might hear it. And what thou well that he speedily carried her the tidings. Meanwhile I hastened to lie to the king's son, and all privily bade him come to me, and not thee. And thereafter by dint of waiting and watching, and taking the only chance that there was, I met thee as thou camest back from fetching the skin of the lion that never was, and gave thee that warning, or else had we been undone indeed. Said Walter, Was the lion of her making, or of thine, then? She said, Of hers, why should I deal with such a matter? Yea, said Walter, but she verily swooned, and she was verily wroth with the enemy. The maid smiled, and said, If her lie was not like very sooth, then had she not been the craftsmaster that I knew her. One may lie otherwise than with the tongue alone. Yet indeed her wrath against the enemy was naught feigned, for the enemy was even I, and in these latter days never did her wrath leave me but to go on with my tale. Now doubt thou not, that, when thou camest into the hall yester-eve, the mistress knew of thy counterfeit tryst with me, and meant naught but death for thee, yet first would she have thee in her arms again. Therefore did she make much of thee at table, and that was partly for my torment also. And therefore did she make that tryst with thee, and deemed doubtless that thou wouldst not dare to forego it, even if thou shouldst go to me thereafter. 
now I had trained that dastard to me, as I have told thee. But I gave him a sleepy draught, so that when I came to the bed he might not move toward me, nor open his eyes. But I lay down beside him, so that the lady might know that my body had been there, for well had she wotted if it had not. Then, as there I lay, I cast over him thy shape, so that none might have known but that thou wert lying by my side. And there, trembling, I abode what should befall. Thus I passed through the hour, when as thou shouldest have been at her chamber, and the time of my tryst with thee was come as the mistress would be deeming, so that I looked for her speedily, and my heart well nigh failed me for fear of her cruelty. Presently, then, I heard a stirring in her chamber, and I slipped from out the bed, and hid me behind the hangings, and was like to die for fear of her. And lo! presently she came stealing in softly, holding a lamp in one hand, and a knife in the other. And I tell thee of a sooth that I also had a sharp knife in my hand, to defend my life, if need were. She held the lamp up above her head, before she drew near to the bedside, and I heard her mutter, She is not there, then, but she shall be taken. Then she went up to the bed, and stooped over it, and laid her hand on the place where I had lain, and therewith her eyes turned to that false image of thee lying there, and she fell a-trembling, and shaking, and the lamp fell to the floor, and was quenched. But there was bright moonlight in the room, and still I could see what betid. But she uttered a noise like the low roar of a wild beast, and I saw her arm and hand rise up, and the flashing of the steel beneath the hand. And then down came the hand and the steel, and I went nigh to swooning, lest perchance I had wrought over well, and thine image were thy very self. The dastard died without a groan. Why should I lament him? I cannot. But the lady drew him toward her, and snatched the clothes from off his shoulders and breast, and fell a gibbering, sounds mostly without meaning, but broken here and there with words. Then I heard her say, I shall forget, I shall forget, and the new days shall come. Then was there silence of her a little and thereafter she cried out, in a terrible voice, Oh, no, 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 I cannot forget, I cannot forget. And she raised a great wailing cry that filled all the night with horror. Didst thou not hear it? And caught up the knife from the bed, and thrust it into her breast, and fell down a dead heap over the bed, and on to the man whom she had slain. And then I thought of thee, and joy smote across my terror. How shall I gainsay it? And I fled away to thee, and I took thine hands in mine, thy dear hands, and we fled away together. Shall we be still together? He spoke slowly, and touched her not. And she, forbearing all sobbing and weeping, sat looking wistfully on him. He said, I think thou hast told me all, and whether thy guile slew her, or her own evil heart, she was slain last night, who lay in mine arms the night before. It was ill, and ill done of me, for I loved not her, but thee, and I wished for her death, that I might be with thee. Thou wottest this, and still thou lovest me, it may be overweeningly. What have I to say, then? If there be any guilt of guile, I also was in the guile. And if there be any guilt of murder, I also was in the murder. Thus we say to each other, and to God and his hallows we say, We too have conspired to slay the woman who tormented one of us, and would have slain the other. And if we have done amiss therein, then shall we two together pay the penalty, for in this have we done as one body and one soul. 
therewith. He put his arms about her, and kissed her, but soberly and friendly, as if he would comfort her. And thereafter he said to her, Maybe to-morrow, in the sunlight, I will ask thee of this woman, what she verily was. But now let her be. And thou, thou art over-wearied, and I bid thee sleep. So he went about, and gathered of bracken a great heap for her bed, and did his coat thereover, and led her thereto. And she lay down meekly, and smiled, and crossed her arms over her bosom, and presently fell asleep. But as for him, he watched by the fireside, till dawn began to glimmer, and then he also laid him down and slept. End of section 8